On today's Question of Faith, can the priest add text to the liturgy? Hey everybody, uh, this is Question of Faith. I am Mike Hayes. I'm the Young Adult Ministry Director here in the Diocese of Cleveland. And I'm Mary Rich. I am the Director of the Office for Worship for the Diocese of Cleveland. Hey Mary, welcome to the show. And uh, Father Damien Ferentz on spring break this week uh, and next week. So we'll be taking a much-deserved break from teaching at the seminary and uh, hope you're enjoying uh, your vacation wherever you are, Father. And uh, Mary, you're new in your role, so tell me a little bit how you, how you got to this place. I have actually homegrown from the Diocese of Cleveland. I was baptized, First Communion, Confirmation, got married, and started ministry life at St. Martin Tours in Maple Heights. Ah. And I have been a liturgical musician since 1984 played in a number of places. I was a regular sub for a number of years, but for the last 25 years, I was the director of liturgy and music at St. Mary Magdalene in Willowick. Nice. That's a great, that's Father Steve Breck's parish, it right? It is. Yeah. That's great. I did some consult out there for young adult ministry. They were a lot of fun. Um, Father Steve's great, so that must have been a lot of fun working with him. He's fun. Yeah, great. And so we brought you in to talk a little bit, you know, we'll talk with you about all things liturgy from time to time, which is always great. And um, so the question that came in this week was, can the priest add words to the liturgy? Very good question. Oof. And when you approached me about this, mm-hmm. I kind of took a straw poll of my friends, because that's how I play this, um, <laughs> and I asked them the same question. And the initial reaction is always no. Yeah. And yeah. the answer is a little more complicated than mm-hmm. that. Okay. So can the priest add words? Well... When it comes to reading scripture, when it comes to reading what we call the presidential texts, mm-hmm. things like the collect or the prayer after communion, he cannot. Mm-hmm. But there are times in the liturgy when the instruction says, in these or similar words. And there are times when he is invited to um, explain a little mm-hmm. bit of what's going on. He's supposed to keep it to just a few words right. and keep it to the meaning of what's going on. Right. But and he yes. can or cannot do that too, he, right? It's, he can, it's up to him. Correct. Right? Yeah. Correct. But when it comes to actually reading the, the words in the Missal, no, he's not allowed to change those. Mm, okay. So, now, can you subtract words? <laughs> That's a really good question. I would say no, unless there's a place where it says it's optional. Right. So, for instance, do we always do the creed at a daily mass? Ah. Or um, there are times when another ritual, for instance, may take the place of, let's, let's talk about Ash Wednesday. Ah. Um, on Ash Wednesday, we receive ashes on our forehead. That is our penitential rite. So on Ash Wednesday, you don't have the typical Kyrie. Oh, sure, right. Because the ashes takes the place of that. So does he omit the words of the Kyrie? Yes. Yes, right. Yeah, it, 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 the answer to most of these things, as always, is it depends. You know, can the priest add words? So it depends. Most of the liturgy, no, he cannot. Some of the liturgy, yeah, if he wants to. I think know. it's just really it's, important for folks to realize that the Roman Missal gives you the rules yeah, that's right. and gives you the words, and, and we are bound to follow that. That's how we manage to have good liturgy. Yeah, yeah. As Bishop Woost would often say to us in class, read the rite. What does the rite say? The rite says this. So do that then. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're supposed to do. And yeah, you know, and he would often point out that the rite is not inflexible. You know, it's it's that there are places in here that allow for you to add different things to it, but within reason and you know and and keep it keep it simple and keep it short you know if it says that you could explain the readings in this part of the mass you can do that but it shouldn't be a mini homily it should be a couple of lines but the homily is a good part of where the priest does use his own words right yeah, he could add all the words there, right? <laughs> or the deacon, for that matter, or the when, deacon when he is matter. given permission to preach. Yes. Absolutely. Exactly. I mean, it's actually the same for everybody, right? You know, the deacon, has, you know, he gets to say words at the time. He's not supposed to change them. You know, the, the last line that he says at the end isn't a big, long thing that he just made up. There's, there are four choices there for him to say, you know. Go in peace is one easy <laughs> keep it simple you know and you don't add any other words to that there you know there are other ways there are other options the deacon has but he's not supposed to make it up on the fly there are there's this concept of progressive solemnity mm. where in general 
there's the, the idea of the solemnity of the cycle of the church. Easter season is bigger and more robust and more majestic, for example, than a penitential season like Advent or Lent, but also within liturgy itself. One piece of the liturgy is not supposed to overshadow other parts. So if your mass generally takes 50 minutes, but your priest is preaching for 35 of that, mm. that homily is overshadowing and kind of taken over what should be the progressive oh, solemnity. Yeah. Just like um, the universal prayer. So the universal, I always tell folks, the universal prayer is people words. We're mm-hmm. allowed to change people words. Sure. We're not allowed to change scripture words, right? <laughs> right? But you shouldn't have a universal prayer that is essentially the same length as the whole entrance rite with mm. the penitential rite. I mean, there there should be some balance within the liturgy itself. So even right. when you're adding words in, you're right, being succinct or being direct is appropriate. Yeah, and we've all been at those masses where it seems to go on and on and on and on and on. You know, <laughs> the funerals are great examples. Funerals you know? are great examples. Weddings are another example. Weddings a lot are of even times, better examples. You know, yeah. the sign of peace, when I was growing up, you always had a little piece of music that was sung or played during the sign of peace, and the sign of peace could take 15 or 20 minutes because the couple wanted to go to all of their bridal party and their immediate family and whatnot, but that makes it feel like the sign of peace was the most important part of that liturgy. Well, Eucharist is the most important part Mm. of that liturgy, and when these people are getting married, that rite of marriage also has a very prominent part in that liturgy. Should the sign of peace be longer than the exchange of consent and rings and the blessing of this union? Probably not, right? Yeah, we want to make it about us, I think. That's that's the thing is people want to make us about us and when we say you know liturgy is the work of the people well yes but it's the work of christ Absolutely. on behalf of the people Absolutely. you know this is about this is about jesus this isn't about you and me necessarily right, right. we're part of that and it's a dialogue and we all a, yes. have our parts the cantor has their part the priest the deacon the people have their part and they should all rightfully take ownership of that that's why we call for full active conscious participation thank you second vatican council <laughs> uh, but yeah that's right you know we all have a part to play i think that's what we need to to realize sometimes the priest has his part to play and so do we mm-hmm. and instead we we kind of put it all on father sometimes right no 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 you're supposed to be actively participating in this doing your role Definitely. in this um and I think even further, but we're we're sent to go forth. Absolutely. You know, and if we don't go forth, then there's there's some incompleteness there. You know, if, if we're not going forth changed by the body of Christ. I was at a workshop yesterday, and my description was, what if we re-envisioned what the weekend liturgy was? And what if mm. we come to Mass worn out and broken and and <laughs> fraught with humanity because that's who we are we're broken say, don't people. We do that anyway that's yeah. who we are right. right but what if we used the mass to be restored mm. and renewed and refilled and then when we are sent go forth glorifying the lord with your life what if we actually did that and we took all that energy and all that restoration and all all that being filled and spread that and then when we came back next time to be restored again, we were all emptied out because we did what we were charged to do. Mm. Well, how differently would our life look? How differently would the lives of those around us look? Yeah, that's, that's what it's supposed to do, right? You know, <laughs> it's amazing to me how we can just go through the motions, right? Well, I'm going to Mass today, all right, well, all right, you know. And, and you even see people sometimes like just fidgeting in their seat, kind of barely responding or whatever. Um, and maybe you do it yourself, you know. I mean, we've all been caught in those things. You know, you come in, you had a fight with someone, you can't, you know, all kinds of things distract you, you know. Um, I used to love the um, guy who was the head of the Boston Philharmonic, whose name is escaping me right now. He used to, he, he did this ep- this thing about silence and how music kind of fills the silence. Mm-hmm. And he said, but, you know, he said, let me play this. And he started playing a piece of Chopin, and he's going on and on and on with the piece. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, he just goes, I don't think we should go on the same place for vacation next year. <laughs> he started, everyone laughs, and he said, how many people were thinking of something else in the middle of that piece? And his thoughts just kind of waft into our heads. And he said, but you know, we need to pay attention. You know, attention must be paid here. And he said, so how can we pay better attention? And he said, it's hard, you know, it's difficult. And he goes, we have to train ourselves to do this. And, uh, and to just commit to that, it doesn't, 
it doesn't have to be a long time, but to practice, it's like a muscle that you have to exercise. Yeah. Practice your time of being able to set aside distractions, set aside the phone, set aside whatever is trying to, to invade, you know, put it in a bubble and say, yes, you merit thought, but not right now. <laughs> I'm going to deal with you later. And maybe if we did that a little bit each day at home, mm. it would be easier once we got to that point in the liturgy where we need it for a longer stretch of time. You know, I love our, my daily prayers. I have to say I'm a big advocate of that. And I think seven and a half, eight minutes, however long it is, if you can just take that time, the world's not going to stop. Right. You know, what's waiting for you is still going to be waiting for you seven minutes later. But if you can commit that time on a regular basis, just like exercise, it helps you uh-huh. become fuller and, and better developed and better formed into what Christ is calling you to be. I spent some time um, on retreat with the Trappists one time in, in one, of the, one of the abbeys. And, um, and I noticed, you know, they're, they're all doing their manual labor. And so, you know, the guy's in the wood shop and he's working and you could tell he, he's just getting this just so and he's he's you know really precise in his measurements obviously and, and everything else and he's working really hard and then all of a sudden the bell went off and he just took a deep breath and exhaled and put down his work and walked into the chapel and you know and they're not supposed to talk and so but there are times when they when when they're able to talk to us and so they i, I came over and i said you know i was watching you work earlier and i said um you know, i was journaling over there and i said i was watching you work and i said and i noticed when the call to prayer came that you very easily just put your work down and i said that would have annoyed the heck out of me like i want to finish this and he said but it was time to pray that was all he said I, you know it was that simple for him it was like but it was time to pray. It wasn't time to finish this. It was time to pray. We can That's be what we do. so driven. And I am absolutely guilty of it. My yeah, husband same. often says I'm one of the most driven people he knows. Um, because I, I can fill every spare moment with something. Something. You know, when you're, when you're a parent and you have a job, you're a multitasker by nature. But what if we were that driven to being attentive to our relationship with Jesus? Yeah. You know, what if we were we were that driven to say every day at this time when that bell goes off or every morning when I get up, every night before I take my last breath, before I fall asleep, what if we were that committed to our relationship mm. with Jesus as opposed to with work or with our cell phone or with the computer or the TV right. or whatever else is distracting? And they're all good and noble things, but we'd need to make room for that and then practice. Right. And, and the, to our question, you know, can, can the priest change words to the liturgy you know, he should be mindful of the words that he's that that he's saying that that, that have been given to him by the church you know, just as a lay eucharistic minister should do the same thing right you know you you, you don't it's it's the body of christ period full stop right. you, you know a, a parish that will remain nameless that is not in this diocese i might add um i walked up to communion one day and the person said receive the bread of life i was like no <laughs> like you, you know like <laughs> Like, I, I just took communion and went on my way, right? But because it, it wouldn't have been appropriate to, to call the person out or anything. And I knew the person, you know, and I went over to her and I said, I said, who taught you to say that? And I was on the parish staff, right? You know, so I was like, who taught you to say that? And, oh, you know, so-and-so. And I was just like, no, you, 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 that's not appropriate. And then we had to have a little retraining of everybody because those things spread like wildfire, right? Habits one, spread yeah, like wildfire. One thing. person started Absolutely. doing it and everybody was doing it because they liked it or they thought it was a good idea or they thought it was the right thing to do. Right. Oh, did we have a change in the liturgy? Right. I didn't know. Oh, I guess I should start saying that now. Right. No. <laughs> right. Absolutely. There's also time for um, sacred silence. Sure. I think... I think we need to be attentive to that. There are places that the Roman Missal calls for that. There are places where, in the Mass, we need a moment to take a breath. Mm. And and relationship, conversation is a two-way street. If we're always talking to God and telling him our needs and telling him what we want and telling him what he's supposed to do, even if we're offering praise and worship and thanksgiving, when does he get an, a word in edgewise? Yeah. <laughs> and the same thing in, in liturgy. There are times when the priest is supposed to read what's there, but there's also times when we're supposed to be quiet yeah. and allow for that moment. Yeah. Yeah. My friend Father Roderick von Hogan, who's a, a podcaster in uh, in the Netherlands, uh, he said that when he first became a priest, he asked 
uh, his parishioners. What what do I really need to know? What do, what do you think I really need to know? And um, they said, well, at liturgy, they said, when you say, let us pray, let us pray. Yeah. Pause. They said, they had a whole bunch of guys who would come, let us pray, God our Father. Yeah. You know, and he was like, it was like we, no, 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 we, we wanted to pray there. <laughs> and you're supposed to pause a little and let people kind of collect their thoughts, right? Um, just as the priest is collecting all those prayers to put into that opening prayer for us. Or the prayer after communion. So, yeah, so all those things. Um, so, Mary, you said you were part of uh, a parish staff, St. Mary Magdalene, right? And, I was. And that's in Willowick, correct? It is. Yeah, yeah. tell me a little bit about your experience there. I have to say, I live in Solon, mm -hmm. and I drove 30 miles every day, wow. seven days a week, yeah. for the last 25 years, <laughs> Wow. because of those people. Mm -hmm. That is a community that is known for its welcome, for it its is. compassion, and its care for each other. It's wonderful because it's, it's very walking distance to the lake. Mm -hmm. So most days I would go take a walk over there. On days I'm frustrated, I would fling rocks into the lake until I couldn't <laughs> lift my arm over my head anymore. <laughs> On good days, I just get energized doing that. It is, you know, water is a source of sustenance and nourishment and cleansing and all good things, and it feeds me. So being by the water was a good thing. But mm. Magdalene's is a beautiful parish. Um, it used to be the longest aisle in the Diocese of Cleveland, well, that's interesting. and they did a renovation a number of years ago and turned it into a monastic layout so that the the altar is in the center and the pews on either side of the altar face, face each, each other, other. Yeah. so that we could see who we pray with and we walk our journey together. It facilitates great participation. Those folks pray so, so well. And that's historical. You know, It goes back to the, the monastic style. It's right? wonderful. Yeah. The piano is also, I've played in a lot of churches in this diocese, and I have to say it's one of the most visible music areas mm. in any parish. Those folks could tell when I changed my toenail polish. <laughs> so it really did raised me to be good about being neat mm. and about um, modeling good participation um, and about being attentive. So that helped train me to be more attentive to what was going on. Nice. I did a young adult consult there uh, when I first, around the time I first started, I guess, and um, they were really responsive and really great. And so I, I think that they're still, they actually spread it out throughout that whole area. Mm -hmm. So they, they've been they've been doing a lot of really good stuff out there. So it's been great. Uh, Father Steve Breck is the pastor. He is. Uh, he has a quirky sense of humor and he loves dark rides at amusement parks. He does. I keep telling him I have to take him up on that because I like those as well. So <laughs> He's also one of the most holy men I know. Yeah, He's same. just a good and faithful servant. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it's funny. My, my wife does not like amusement park rides. So when I find someone who does, I'm, I'm like, um, could could I go with you like whenever <laughs> you're going? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, we have to do that. Um, so that's funny. So I'll have to take him up on that. Uh, so hey, our readings for the fourth Sunday of Lent. Uh, this one will come from the Gospel of John. Um, uh, this is an easy one. You see it all over sports stadiums. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. That's John 3.16. You it see, is. You know. There was a Bible school song. I don't think for copyright purposes I'm allowed to sing it to you, mm -hmm. although I could. Um, you probably sing a line, maybe. John 3.16 said that God so loved the world he gave his only oh, begotten yeah. son. Got it. I can get now, there are very few times I don't have one of those eidetic memories like my husband does. Mm. I take notes, copious notes, lots of notes. Um, but some of the best ways to memorize scripture, to remember scripture, is to set it to music. Oh, very nice. I started teaching that song to Bible school kids back in the, gosh, 1980s, mm -hmm. early 90s, and can still come up with the words to that verse because of that Bible school song. So I, I do say... Learn stuff to music. That's helpful. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> and so, Mary, I, good luck in your new position here. Thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll have you back next week, and we'll talk a little bit more while Father D is still away. And um, we'll have this and a whole lot more next time here on Question of Faith.